Welcome to today's webinar, Achieving Resilient and Assured PNT and Secure Smart Grids, brought to you by GPS World Magazine and our sponsor of the event, Asilo Courts. Before we get started, I want to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode. A recording of this webinar will be posted to gpsworldmagazine.com slash webinars and will also be emailed to you tomorrow. At this time, I'd like to acquaint you with the ways you can participate during today's presentation. Please notice the Q&A panel at the left-hand side of your console. If you have a question, type it in the panel's text box, then click Submit to place your question in queue. We encourage you to ask and enter any questions you may have for our speakers during the presentation. We will address these questions at the end of the presentation during the Q&A portion. Questions submitted during registration have already gone to our panelists and may be covered during the presentation. If you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, you may use the same Q&A panel on your screen to submit your issue, and I or technical support specialist Marie Emmerich will personally assist you. You may learn more about our speakers by viewing their photo, bio, and email address in the panel located on the upper left-hand side of your console. If you are logged into your social media accounts, you can share the webinar's title, description, and URL with your friends or colleagues using the Share This widget you'll see in the bottom left corner of the screen. Finally, at the bottom right of the console, you will find a PDF of today's presentation slides, which you can download and a link to visit the Asilocourts website. I'm Aurora Harris, content marketing producer for GPS World Magazine, and I will be your moder moderator for today's webinar. And now I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Today we will be hearing from Nino DeFalsis, Senior Director of Business Development of Asilo Quartz Americas. Nino is an expert in the time, frequency, and synchronization industry with over 25 years of experience working for several industry-related companies. Next, we will hear from Dana Goward, President of Resilient Navigation and Timing Foundation, a scientific and educational charity dedicated to protecting GPS, GNSS signals and users. And lastly, we will hear from Laurent Gaillé, Senior Solution Engineering Consultant of Asilo Quartz. Laurent is a technical expert in the time, frequency and synchronization industry with over 10 years of experience working with several telecom operators and ed energy distributor customers. And at this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Nino. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to present today the, the Achieving Resilient and Assured PNT in Secure Smart Grid. So why do I have these pictures? As you can see, uh, can your uh, timing survive for the next uh, cyber attack? Uh, cyber attacks are everywhere. Uh, you can see them uh, all over the world, and they're growing in sophistication. Actually, I'm also showing in this uh, picture that uh, space is under attack to, in fact, uh, some uh, technology from Russians can actually shoot down all our satellite and then, and of course, uh, put GPS uh, on its knees and, and basically jeopardize all the GPS system or the GPS navigation system. On the ground, we have seen some cyber attacks from jamming, spoofing, and not only from uh, an external um, matter, but also from a network perspective. And I'm going to cover those cyber uh, threats. The next slide here shows uh, that uh, time stamping accuracy is tightening from NTP to PTP. NTP used to be millisecond accuracy, PTP is microsecond accuracy. Why is that drive happening? As you can see, there used to be a passive environment or ecosystem on the grid where everything is very simple, centralized, uh, one directions, uh, AC to the consumers, and that's shifting now to an active ecosystem where we have renewable energies, is bi-directionals. Uh, there is, a, on the consumer side, we have AC and DC to deal with, and that is becoming more complex to manage. And on top of that, you're adding all the electrical uh, vehicles that are actually being connected to the grid, and all that need to be timestamped to a higher accuracy. Here at the table on the right, 
you can see that synchrophaser has to be uh, at low one microsecond accuracy, fault location even 100 nanosecond, and for micro PMUs, that's even better than one microsecond. And then at the substation, the, pre the protocol, the GOOSE 618050 has to be as low as 100 microsecond. And then if you use the sample value is even a one microsecond. So you can see that the requirements is becoming tighter. And as a result of that, PTP is the choice or the protocol of choice for network synchronization. My next slide is a little bit about uh, some education about what's resilient PNT. Resilient PNT started with an executive order two years ago in the US, but it has followed even in UK and Euro commissions with the same mandate. Basically the mandate is that we have to protect uh, GNSS or GPS if it goes down and therefore protect critical infrastructure uh, that depends on uh, GNSS and GPS. How do we do that? We deploy resilient self-survival PNT system through a short PNT system. And what are the critical infrastructure that need to be protect protected? There are actually five here that I'm showing. Here I'm going to be talking about the smart grid, but you can see finance, transportation, communication, and data centers have to be protected as well. What are the materials that have been produced so far? There is a guidelines here, uh, the DHS conformance framework. I have a slide about that. There is the NIST cyber security profile. That's basically drives what's the risk profile for the end user that is willing to take or, or, or not take. Basically, there is a cost for that uh, uh, security profile. And finally, there is a standard that is basically taking all the above and basically standardizing and coming out with a standard within a year about how uh, critical infrastructure can be protected if GPS goes down. My next slide is about what's the problem in the smart grid. Well, as you can see, there is an econom economical cost. If GPS is disrupted, it's evaluated to about one billion per day. I'm adding here the data center. Why, as you know, everything is migrating to the data center in terms of data. So we have to protect the data equally. And actually, if I would be a bad guy, I would actually attack data center first, because if you attack data center, you attack actually all the industries at once, as opposed to just the smart grid. So data center is also an infrastructure that needs to be protected. My next slide is about uh, what are the cyber threats and vulnerabilities. So we have identified two of them. There is external and internal. On the external side, there are environmental, very well-known, solar flare. They're very, very common. Another one popped up recently, volcano eruptions. I think a couple of months ago, there was a huge volcano eruptions, and the ash is going up to... Uh, 30,000 feet can actually impact the GPS signal that is very weak. The jamming, you can buy a jammer off uh, the street for $20, so that's very common. The spoofing is something that used to be rare, but now actually we see more spoofing attacks, and they are more sophisticated. Like we know two of them that are well known. There is a synchronous uh, spoofing and a synchronous spoofing. Uh, the former one is the one that is the most complex to detect. And then we have adjacent transmitter. Uh, that's under review. The ground station, which is the, the control mechanism that basically manages all the GPS, the GNSS system. Very rare. We haven't seen anything uh, on, the, on the ground station. On the internal side, well, as you know, cyber threats are more dangerous from the inside in than from the outside out. So, so basically, internal has to be very uh, carefully monitored and, and protected. In fact, uh, NTP has already been disrupted. It's called NTP amplification, very common out there. Uh, PTP hasn't been uh, disrupted yet. Nothing has happened. But as you can see, both protocols utilizes messaging uh, to get basically that accuracy. And those messagings are not protected today. So a bad guy, a, a, an actor could actually go in and hack the network, access the messaging, and basically disrupt NTP, PTP very easily 
if they have the know-how. Uh, the same way boundary clocks uh, that uses the PTP NTP messaging, they can be at stake. The network can be attacked, either blocked, interfered, and the client as well. And the Genesis receiver is an active element connected to the network. So a bad guy can actually attack the receiver from the inside in and basically uh, disrupt a GPS or the synchronization system. Again, hopefully all those events, PTP, boundary clock, Genesis receiver from the inside has not been hacked yet. So it's very rare, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't be protected. My next slide is about the, a little bit about what's the, the Department of Homeland Resist, re, re, Resiliency Guidelines is. Uh, there is a core functions, uh, prevent, respond, recover. There are some resiliency levels. The end goal is defense in depth. How much do you want to have of that defense in depth? Some are buying 80%, some are buying 99.9%, .9%, especially in a defense environment where synchronization cannot fail on a battlefield. Therefore, uh, the defense in depth has to be 99.9%. Uh, so the levels that they have defined here on these guidelines is level one, basically one source, level two, two source, level three, three sources. There has to have, when you have multiple sources, you have to have also validation, cross-check and verification. And the last one is basically level four is a next gen with multiple sources, can be five, 10. The idea is to diversify as much as possible and basically take the best source at any given time or in real time. My next slide is about how the future smart grid will look like uh, with our uh, Assured PNT technology. You can see that there are a lot of renewables, there is electrical charges, uh, there is not enough power today to feed even the electrical uh, uh, cars that are going to be plugged into the, the grid. So, but two, two components of this grid that needs to be managed properly is the telecom connectivity, where the data basically has to be provided uh, and controlled by the, the smart grid. For that, there are some core edge uh, telecom uh, networks that are synchronized today. They even have some data centers uh, which have already their own synchronization. One is time as a service. The other one is GPS backup as a service. On the protection side, uh, we have different components of the grid, like the DEERS, the, the distributed energy resources uh, that has to be generated. So it has to be synchronized. The grid control, the transmission flow, the grid management. As you can see, all those pieces have to be timed at a different level, and that is what synchronization is all about, to timestamp the data and have a global view of your grid so that you can manage the flow, the loads, and how the grid basically exchanges bidirectionally all that energy to the end users. My next slide is about what's our technology to do that, to defend the smart grid. At the top, you can see that we have a multi-source platform. We have anti-jamming antenna. We have GNSS source, source, which is the source utilized today. We have cesium backup. We have PTP backup, which is the PTP network backup. We have holdover oscillator on the devices, and we have other sources of opportunity. All those sources have to be detected, validated, backup used, and mitigated and that's done through our framework that we call zero trust multi-source backup. Why zero trust? Because we don't trust any sources to, to start with. And we take all the sources that we can manage and then we cross-check them, we measure them, and we pick the best one at any given source. Again, the philosophy is that if you want this defense in depth at 99.9%, working with more sources will achieve that goal. At the bottom, you can see is all the management system. So uh, uh, we have a management system that has all the control visibility of the network uh, end to end. And therefore you can do GNSS assurance, you can do sync assurance, you can PTP assurance. Basically we uh, segregate each function 
and then manage them on a global scale. We even have an open uh, interface that can basically manage a third party uh, receivers or vendors uh, as, as we wish or as the end user wish. The next slide is how do we achieve the multi-source backup? Basically, the strategy is augment protection, diversify sources, deploy neural software intelligence that has a global view of the network. On the augmented protection, we have four categories. On the antenna, where you can use an anti-jam antenna uh, or different accessories that can be put between the antenna and the receiver. Then we can use the receiver, a different receiver type. We have single band, multi band receiver. You can even put two receivers uh, in order to uh, detect spoofing. As you know, spoofing is very difficult to detect, but if you use two receivers, one in fixed mode, one in navigational mode, if there is any sophistication, uh, sophisticated spoofing, the GNSS receiver in navigational mode will see its coordinate change and therefore you can detect a spoofing uh, um, event. On the device side, we have GPS as a source, we have cesium as a backup, and we have a holdover clock, or we can even take other sources of, the, uh, of uh, alternative sources from the second block that can feed into the device. On the network side, we have PTP network, we have APTS backup, and we have the whole management system that has the view of all the blocks here since they're integrated and therefore by adding all those blocks all together we can achieve not only level four resiliency but we can even enhance that level four resiliency to a, a, an enhanced level four how does that look like with our product so i'm um, clockwise antenna here even though it's an anti-jam antenna with a 20 percent uh, uh, elevation from the ground. The bad guy goes, goes on, a, on a high rise, uh, jams the antenna, and therefore the GPS goes down. Here, hopefully, we have a cesium backup as a second source so the grandmaster here doesn't go down. We can add some more sources here. Uh, we, can add the, we can have the PTP backup from a peer uh, grandmaster that is a network that would provide here the PTP backup to that grandmaster. We can add some more backup sources like NIST, White Rabbit, uh, Eloran that is going to come um, within the next couple of years, or even any LEO satellite receiver time. Uh, the management system here provides the global view of everything, PTP assurance, GNSS assurance, and we even have open interface to get the data from any receivers, from any vendor out there. And we gather all the info, that information and we can basically protect uh, from any GNSS attack. But again, GNSS attack is only one side of the fence. The other side is what happens if the network is attacked and therefore PTP and NTP signal are at stake. My next slide is about the architecture, uh, timing architecture in a grid core station substation. As you can see, we have here a massive attack, two grandmaster here that I'm showing, but we could have five grandmaster. So grandmaster A gets attacked here and it falls back with the, the cesium backup clock. We can add some more sources, ELO, RAN, LEO, NIST, you name it. That grandmaster has now a trusted EPRTC configuration because it is bundled with a cesium clock and therefore it distributes PTP backup through the network. Here, PTP is recommended to be configured with a la 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 layer two profile. That means all the switches are PTP aware, bang, boundary clock, and it feeds the PTP to the grandmaster at the substation, which is down also, but thanks to the PTP backup, it basically is operating normally, even, G even though GPS has been attacked and distributes the timing to the substation, either legacy uh, interface or PTP uh, power profiles to the substation. The, the management system has the, all, has the whole view of, the, 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 of the, the network and it has all the data and therefore alerts the users that there has been a massive attack and also uh, uh, provide peace of mind to the users since 
Grandmaster A and Grandmaster B, even though they are they went they they went down from a GPS protecting, they are protected by the mechanism that I just explained. My next slide is about the management system. So here you can see, for instance, that uh, the two location has gone down, the core and the substation has been attacked uh, GPS wise, but there is a recovery mechanism near the timing chain. You can see that the core has been recovered by the EPRTC backup from the cesium, distributing PTP over the network. The substation, even though it's down, it's recovered because uh, it takes the PTP failover from the backup to uh, recover itself. Here we see uh, at the network devices, even though it's been attacked, nothing has happened at the devices because it's been backed up by the cesium. And uh, the other device at the substation, even though it's been attacked, nothing has happened because it takes the backup from the network to be recovered. Here we see the, the, part, the topology from the core to the substation with the backup failover, uh, EPRTC and PTP from the network. Here we can measure the signal that goes to the substation, which is a PTP backup to provide assurance. And finally, here we see the... the all the analytics of all the the receivers, it could be a thousands of those receivers, and we can see the data, the analytics, and provide assurance even from third-party vendors. Here, I'm showing the management system has all that intelligence to make the switchover, the self-survivability. Actually, the diagram here on the left shows that even though you have two sites that are being attacked from a GPS perspective, you could even show 10 sites there. As long as you have one site that has EPRTC, it will maintain the self-survivability across all the network. My next slide is about a use case here, uh, the DOE Darknet. There is a website you can go. Basically, they have uh, implemented uh, a defense in-depth infrastructure with a zero trust multi-source backup technology. They're using cesium as a backup. They're using PTP as a backup from the network. They're using NIST Stratum Zero as a backup source and even LEO as a, an alternative sources of opportunity. Here it shows a diagram of what they're trying to achieve. There's plenty of documentation on the, um, on, on the website that you can see to see more uh, information about this architecture. Here is our product range. As you can see, we provide a, a, a big product range or a large product range, but the, the key here is that we have the best fit, the best cost, because you don't want to put a large box, for instance, uh, on the edge. And, and so depending on your application, if it's access, edge, or core, you deploy the best product at the best price. My next slide, that's the takeaway. Basically, I introduced the, the, the shift from NTP to PTP, uh, bidirectional, uh, the critical infrastructure uh, that needs to be have new resilient PNT requirements, the smart grid components, uh, the zero trust multi-source backup, and finally, the, the different architecture, either at the core, substation, or overall management system. Thank you very much, and I'm going to hand it over to Dana who will give you his perspective of a resilient PNT. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you, Nino. Uh, I think everybody can tell that uh, Nino is worried and working really hard. So my job is to tell you why he's worried and uh, working really hard, even more than uh, what he's told you so far. So um, join me in a little bit of a thought experiment and a journey into the uh, not too distant future, let's say uh, July 7th of 2023. And all of a sudden people start to notice that their ways and Google Maps uh, aren't working. They, they can't get an Uber or a Lyft. Our first responders notice they're having trouble getting to uh, the scenes of incidents and uh, their common operational pictures are not working. Uh, their land mobile radios don't work that well either. And then uh, tra traffic is just building up everywhere uh, you could possibly look. Uh, over time, uh, the uh, cell phone connections start to be really shaky and the lights start to waver and blink as the electrical grid becomes harder and harder to manage. And after about 48 hours, there have been about 120 traffic deaths that above what would have been predicted. Uh, 
about uh, $7 billion worth of economic loss and accidents. And there's been a near miss where an airliner uh, has almost uh, almost been lost. So pretty scary stuff. And, and why is that? Well, it's because uh, GPS is free. It's really good. And it's everywhere. Uh, but it's uh, also because everything uh, depends upon GPS. And that's really not the problem. Uh, well, I mean, it's the basis of the problem. But the real problem is that everything also depends on everything else. So when you look at cascading failures and inter interdependencies and that sort of thing, you get what uh, that G uh, DHS quote uh, up on the top, that GPS is a single point of failure for critical infrastructure. And actually, I noticed that that's an old quote, and we really need to update it, because in December, we heard those very same words from the White House, from a member of the national security staff, that GPS is a single point of failure. Um, it's really important, uh, but it is also really vulnerable. Uh, you probably know that GPS is a really, really, really weak signal that uh, even though it's been leveraged by darn near everybody because it's so free and accurate and available, uh, it's very vulnerable. The sun and the stars make more noise than a GPS satellite does. And so any little kind of transmission on the frequency will deny GPS uh, a reception for you. And, and the possibilities are nearly endless in terms of intentional and accidental interference. You can, uh, on the intentional side and the natural side, you can go from uh, the, the small end of, of a jammer that would cost you about $15 to, uh, as Nina was talking about, uh, cyber attacks and military uh, 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 interference, uh, and even Mother Nature with um, uh, massive coronal mass injections that uh, have the potential to ionize the atmosphere for days or even destroy satellites in the work, worst cases. So. So it's a um, uh, really important, but it's in danger by interference and jamming. And while uh, there haven't been a whole lot of studies about this in the United States, the European Commission decided to take a sample uh, a couple of years ago uh, and just put some um, detectors around um, in various locations. And as you can see here, they uh, at this point in their study, they had detected over 450,000 uh, events, most of which I have to say were accidental, don't, did not appear to be intentional, um, which goes to show you how many um, how many events out there uh, are uh, just by accident. But of the intentional ones, they also found out that the um, uh, the bad guys are getting better, that there are various uh, families of uh, jammers, and that the technology is getting more and more sophisticated. Uh, so that's intentional interference. Uh, uh, and unintentional interference on the strike three. But uh, a refinement, as you probably all know, is, um, on the intentional interference is spoofing, where um, a, a malicious actor uh, transmits information to make you think you are at a different place or it is a different time uh, than what it really is. And we first heard about this in a James Bond movie in 1998, but golly gee, uh, it finally appeared in the uh, open media in 2011 when Iran somehow ended up with this CIA drone that was operating next door in Afghanistan. And they explained that, yes, what they had done is they transmitted uh, false GPS data to the uh, receiver on the, the drone and coaxed it over to landing in the, uh, in, in the Iranian um, uh, air base. Now, of course, uh, uh, a lot of people in the United States said, no, it's not possible, it didn't happen, couldn't be. Uh, but then uh, shortly thereafter that, um, in the University of Texas, uh, my friend, Professor Humphrey, said, of course it's possible. Watch, I'll do it for you. And he showed how he could do that with a, uh, with a drone fairly easily. And then not too long after that, uh, there was a hackers convention where this young lady from China was, said, you know, you can build your own GPS spoofer. It's relatively easy. And by the way, I've got a kit full of parts to help you um, help you put one together. Uh, so it's really come down to the level of uh, of the informed hobbyist where you can do GPS spoofing. And of course, um, uh, nation states do uh, spoofing all the time. Uh, this is an example of uh, uh, from the Black Sea where uh, Russia is trying to protect its um, VIPs by making 
all the drones that might be interfering with their activities think that they're at airports and making them fly away from where the VIPs are. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to look at this and you're interested, check out the C4 ADS uh, report on that. It's, uh, it's pretty darn fascinating. Uh, and then a refinement on that where uh, spoofers, uh, these, these kind of industrial nation state kind of spoofers have leaked into the dark market, we think, is uh, this circle spoofing, cross-global circle spoofing that we have uh, detected where uh, ships end up uh, way across the globe uh, from where they really are. And they, they report that they're doing circles off Point Reyes, California, when in fact we know that they are actually someplace else. So... So, uh, so very important and very, um, uh, very vulnerable, very easy to, uh, to counteract. And in despite all of the money and effort and time put into uh, GNSS, <clears throat> the uh, collective name for all of the GPS-like uh, national systems, uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of um, time and effort and expertise to, uh, to counteract all that good work. And it's why the European Union uh, up there at the top uh, has uh, decided that uh, GNSS alone uh, is really not sufficient if you really, really got to have PNT or, or even time. Uh, and then, of course, uh, aside from all of that, uh, recently we have discovered uh, quite to our uh, chagrin that, um, as I think Nino mentioned, uh, that uh, space is no longer a safe sanctuary and the Russians have demonstrated that by showing how they can use a ground-based missile to shoot down a, a satellite, and they have claimed that they can shoot down all 32 GPS satellites or, at once. Whether or not they can actually do that yet uh, is uh, is yet to be uh, determined, uh, but I can tell you they do have nuclear-powered uh, electronic warfare satellites that can jam across the entire face of the planet. So uh, probably, uh, probably uh, more of an academic point than... Uh, and one in terms of what kind of threats we really need to be worried about, and and uh, not to be uh, not to be outdone, the uh, the Chinese uh, are, are um, uh, coming up fast in space as well. Undoubtedly, have surpassed the Russians and are even at least even with us, um, and have demonstrated recently uh, that they can reach out and touch satellites as well. Quite literally, um, in January they. Uh, sent a satellite up that uh, was a grabber satellite that grappled uh, an old satellite they had and just threw it out of orbit, uh, and tossed it away like it was a toy. Uh, this is actually a, uh, a scene from the uh, Space Force TV show where a giant, chap, uh, Chinese satellite comes by and clips the solar panels off of um, Steve Carell's uh, brand new uh, satellite that he just put up. Uh, perhaps another, like James Bond, perhaps another uh, example of uh, art um, uh, anticipating our real life. So what do we do all about it? Uh, well, we uh, we take the approach of protect, toughen, and augment at the R&T Foundation. We're protecting the signals, having better equipment like what uh, Nino is talking about, and uh, augmenting with other signals and sources so that uh, folks like Nino can uh, ingest those sources and uh, uh, GPS is augmented, and we have a multi-system um, uh, approach with diverse methods of delivery that uh, if one of them is disrupted, very, uh, very low chance that um, the other uh, uh, would be at the same time, or at least it would be very, very difficult for an adversary to do that. Uh, you may or may not know that uh, the last time the Department of Transportation, which is the lead federal agency for position and navigation timing issues in the federal government spoke on this was in a report to Congress of January last year. And they said what's needed is signals from space, fiber, uh, and terrestrial broadcast uh, in order to make, uh, make the U.S. safe. So that is something that we are supporting at the R&T Foundation because those seem to be as about a diverse methods of delivery as we could possibly imagine as well. Uh, so that is the end of uh, my talk. I'm uh, looking forward to hanging around and answering questions. I always thought that was the best part of most presentations. And now roll the clip, I think is what I should say, or maybe I'll let Aurora take it over there. Okay, so let's move to the demo.
So I just want uh, to uh, remind you about uh, the skin itself. So I am preparing the lab. Hello everyone. Um, so let's move on for a demonstration. So thank you, Dana. Thank okay, you. So let's move to the demo. So I just want uh, to uh, remind you about uh, the skin itself. So I have prepared in the lab a couple of devices. So we will uh, use our network manager system that will be uh, some sort of uh, uh, database to collect all the data and where we have some uh, machine learning, so some uh, really advanced uh, algorithm that will uh, study uh, the different sites, so the different data of the GPS that can be potentially attack and eventually we can uh, take some action like locking out the gps and uh, keeping the uh, frequency source coming from the system so we have the core devices so i have prepared two of them in the lab uh, 15412 and 15422 uh, but one with a pure uh, gps embedded and a second one where we use a ttp feed coming from 15405 that has an embedded antenna. And at the substation site, I have prepared a 5405 that receive uh, PTP uh, input uh, from a power profile perspective. Okay, so C37 or 2017 uh, as a backup of the GPS itself. So, and on top of that, we're going to see that we can actually monitor the GPS against the cesium, we can monitor the PTP feed input against the GPS, we can compare it, we can set some threshold limit. And again, based on that, uh, we can take uh, some uh, action, actually, uh, in case of a GPS attack. This is basically the ensemble controller, which is the network manager system. So this is, first of all, uh, the 5412 I was talking about, where we basically have a Okay, so let's move to the demo. I just want uh, to uh, remind you about uh, the scheme itself. So I have prepared in the lab a couple of devices. So we will uh, use our network manager system that will be uh, some sort of uh, uh, database to collect all the data and where we have some uh, machine learning, so some uh, really advanced uh, algorithm that will uh, study uh, the different sites, so the different data of the GPS that can be potentially attack. And eventually, we can uh, take some action like locking out the GPS and uh, keeping the uh, frequency source coming from the system. So we have the core devices, so I have prepared two of them in the lab, uh, 15412. 15422, uh, but one with a pure uh, GPS embedded, and a second one where we use a PTP feed coming from 15405 that has an embedded antenna. And at the substation site, I have prepared a 5405 that receive uh, PTP uh, input uh, from a power profile perspective. Okay, so C37 or 2017. Uh, as a backup of the GPS itself. So, and on top of that, we're going to see that we can actually monitor the GPS against the cesium. We can monitor the PTP feed input against the GPS. We can compare it. We can set some threshold limit. And again, based on that, uh, we can take uh, some uh, action, actually, uh, in case of a GPS attack. This is basically the ensemble controller, which is the network manager system. So this is, first of all, uh, the 5412 I was talking about, where we basically have a GPS uh, input uh, as first priority, and uh, 10 megahertz as second one in case of GPS uh, <clears throat> attack. And then the PTP output that comes from the same PLM. So this is a PLM basically for phase in time. 
and of course our internal oscillator that is in ash right now because it's not used uh, because we are using the, uh, the GPS input uh, instead. This is an EPRTC, as I said, and the second unit actually is this 5405 power uh, at the substation, where again, we have this entity uh, time clock. So it has GPS in, and it has as a backup a PTP clock feed. Okay, so we cannot see the feed itself because there are a couple of transparent clock switch in between. Uh, this 5405 has a particularity that is able actually to deliver different legacy uh, protocols uh, for uh, for power industry. Uh, I can eventually show you because the NMS is pure read only, so this is not where we're going to configure the unit. So if I show you the uh, common line of that guy, so basically we can see that this guy now is a slave and is synchronized in acquisition for phase uh, where uh, we have the rate, which is one, um, <clears throat> one uh, packet per second. Uh, what else? It's a peer-to-peer -peer mechanism because it's the power profile, clock class six, and then we can see a couple of other things. So like the mean pass delay offset from master. That guy has a GPS connection as well. So we're going to see that we can monitor uh, a couple of things. We have the cesium itself. So let me just show you how the cesium looks like. So this is basically the element manager of the cesium. We can double check the logical view. So the input, the output, of course, all the outputs, so you see. There are some PPS or 10 megahertz, the one that I'm using currently uh, for my EPRTC uh, combiner. So let me just disconnect this. And uh, <clears throat> let me show you the web user interface of the 5412. So this is the PTP clock entity with this uh, profile or power that I'm currently using. So I can see that uh, it's uh, completely uh, locked. And I have uh, the PTP port that's in clock class six to my subtended device with the right packet rate. The other device that I'm using as well for the demonstration is the 5422. As a EPRTC again, but what is different here is that the GPS of the main board of the shelf, okay, so if we check the shelf itself, uh, uh, you see we have a picture with the shelf, so if there is any alarms that may happen, we're going to see the alarm of which port uh, is in. So this is available for all devices as well. But here, the first field is a PTP clock. Okay, so this PTP clock is used as a source for the phase and time, instead of having directly a GPS uh, from the main board. And still, we have the 10 megahertz. So the PTP feed is coming from this 5405 multiband unit. Okay, so this is a small uh, cigarette box like with uh, embedded antenna. So what is interesting in that case of this 5405 is that it's a multiband one. I'm using two different constellations, GPS Galileo right now because I'm based in Switzerland, as you know. And uh, here, this is the feed. So this guy is just synchronized to GPS, but I'm using PTP, which is a two-way time transfer protocol to synchronize my 5422. So by saying that, what is interesting is that with the 5422, I can actually monitor a couple of things. And this is this part here that we are checking right now. We can check the GPS of the main board against the cesium. So possibly later on, I can have as a third or as a second priority, I would say, the GPS aside of the PTP feed coming from the 5405. I have, I'm monitoring the PTP input against the cesium, so I can compare. So if that guy, that GPS is under attack, 
and my 5405 is located at a different place because the connection in between those two guys are a fiber, so it can be hundreds of kilometers in between both. Uh, and then um, I can compare uh, both and I can say, okay, so there is something that uh, is happening wrong, so I can decide to lock out again the GPS because it's not a source anymore that I can rely on to. So if I check those two guys first in terms of time error, time interval error, I would say, because it's basically the cesium that is used as a reference against. So I see that there are a couple of things that is going on. So due to the fact that I just powered the unit uh, uh, this morning, so as you can see, uh, this is not really stable, I would say. If I check uh, the PTP against the cesium here, what do I have again? I have such a graphic, okay, so you see here, it's a bit more stable, but still, uh, again, because uh, the devices are not running for a couple of days, so it's required a couple of days before we can uh, rely completely uh, against. So I can possibly uh, check uh, the anti against different masks. Of course, we have the PRTCA, we have the EPRC mask eventually. So if I run, uh, this uh, portion of uh, measurement. Of course, I'm crossing here the EPRC mask due to the fact that I'm good. I'm I'm getting a couple of a spike here. Okay, so saying that, if there is an attack, for sure we're gonna have a big drift or at least uh, something like a spike that will uh, uh, steer actually uh, my database or my network manager system. And this manager's, manager system will be able actually to look out a reference by using a GNSS firewall. Okay, so we have the different entity here where we have uh, the time clock. So remember, it's the phase clock of the phase and time. And the different condition here about uh, different things like GPS jamming condition. And I can set some rule for all of those conditions saying, okay, I want to lock out now the GPS after a zero second. And once uh, the attack is gone, so I can clear the lockout uh, GPS. Of course, all the data that are retrieving from the receivers are not uh, streamed, but uh, we are uh, getting the data every minute or eventually every five minutes. So more data we have, more accurate we can be in terms of um, uh, detecting any of those conditions like spoofing or jamming for all different constellations. So basically, this is where I want uh, to go right now uh, about the uh, <coughs> GNSS assurance itself. So this is right there. Okay, so any uh, GPS receiver, as you can see here, we are in Europe, in Europe, so in Switzerland, basically, because I'm based in all my devices are allocated to in Switzerland. So if I select my receiver uh, of my 5422 uh, here, Okay, so this is uh, the 54.22. And aside, uh, I can set a different time range, so I can double check the last 24 hours what uh, was happening. So I have different things, so like the GPS L1 number of satellites, the carrier to noise ratio and the automatic gain control levels. Uh, so this is all information that are from the G GNSS receiver. Uh, here, I, in that case, uh, I have uh, basically a multiband receiver. Oh, no, it's not a multiband receiver, sorry, that one. This is why I'm so actually I'm using 5405 as a PTP input uh, using multiband. But if I check the 5405, 
again, it's the same. I'm getting same type of information, but now I can double check some other band. Okay, so this is GPS L1, L2, and so so I can compare different Genesis receiver. Can compare uh, that guy uh, saying, okay, just want to check the GPS L1, and I can compare uh, another one by saying I want to compare with the other band. So you see that the band of the same unit are quite alike. Uh, from this morning, we can see that there was something that happened quite wrong, I would say, that uh, where the satellites in use were quite low. So this is uh, why uh, I have set an additional probe here, uh, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, in regards of the PTP feed itself. So this is the probe, probe, probe that you can see here. So the PTP two-way time error. So if I check that guy, I can see that there was something wrong here in the middle. Okay, it was quite stable, but something happened wrong due to the fact that a lot of satellites were uh, not uh, available. Uh, actually, uh, only few of the satellites were available at a certain period of time. So this is what we can double check here. So I can monitor the PTP feed against the CDM. Uh, and I can monitor the PTP feeds against the GPS. So this is here a pure a time error. So this is a phase and time measurement. And again, compare with some end time mask and see uh, what's uh, going on. OK, uh, now. Um, what else to say? Actually, uh, we have some additional uh, functionalities like uh, NEMS test uh, reports that can be used based on some criteria. So we can set different criteria for a period of time again and analyze and see if something went wrong. So for uh, the, this one, uh, all is quite OK. So of course, uh, we have uh, some additional things like the CNO uh, carrying noise ratio heat map. We have some sort of histogram uh, and, and stuff like that. So based on that, we can say if the site uh, is a good site, a good installation, first of all, if there is no obstruction. And um, let's check, for instance, that guy with this else test based on the criteria I got before. So if I run here for this period of time, we can see that it failed because of this. So we have some logs that are available. And we can see uh, what was wrong based on the criterion. So here we see the minimum number of satellites with good carry to nose ratio and elevation per observation in between two days this morning for 15 minutes was not good. So I can zoom, up, apply the zoom, first of all, and you see on the back that during this period of time, it was not uh, good enough for my criteria. So with all that tool, so the collection of the GPS uh, receiver plus the different monitoring the probing, Okay, so I have I showed you uh, the 5422 uh, probing, but we have the same for this uh, 5405 here, uh, where uh, I have the probe of the PTP against its own GPS, and again, I can check. So this is again a time error. So we see that there is something that happened here in the middle. So theoretically for a power uh, for different uh, type of equipment in smart grid. The limit, as you have seen, uh, is uh, one microsecond. So this is purely our limit. Usually, the anti-mask in power is not uh, really uh, relevant in that case. OK, so we have the same. And again, I can make some zoom of particular part. I can even apply a couple of things like uh, 
uh, low pass filter. Okay, so let's say I want to have a low pass filter at 250 as per uh, call for master in uh, power application. Uh, then change here uh, to low pass filter and and then I see the limit. So I see that I cross the limit. So again, as soon as the limit are crossed based on my threshold limit, everything will happen into my network management system um, uh, into the events, uh, alarms, and so. So here, all here, you're going to get a SNMP trap. So either SNMP V2C or V3 that is secure and that will inform the user that something is going wrong. And that's it, actually. That's a really um, a general overview or uh, demonstration, really high level demonstration of this uh, useful tool. So do not hesitate to uh, send me an email if you have any qu concern or question, or if you want to have eventually uh, some more uh, demonstration in the near future. So thank you very much and uh, have a good day. All right, guys, thank you. Um, thank you, Laurent, too, for that uh, demonstration um, and apologies for the technical difficulty there. Um, but now we're gonna go ahead and jump into a few questions that we received during the presentation and during uh, registration. So the first question that I have is, let's see, with the ease, GNSS jamming, what are the prospects of using unconventional methods for PNT solutions? Well, I can uh, jump in and uh, uh, try on that one if you'd like, Aurora. So yeah, I, I, go for it. Lots of folks, lots of folks are trying all kinds of unconventional PNT solutions. Of course, we're just talking about timing today. Timing is available in a, in a number of ways, both wirelessly over, and over fiber. Uh, but uh, uh, so the prospects are good in terms of the technology, not so great in terms of technology adoption, though. GPS, uh, GNSS generally works pretty good, and a lot of folks uh, don't see the need or the business case for accessing other, anything other than, than GPS. And they tend to think that, well, if GPS goes, uh, goes wrong, it's not my fault, it's the government's fault, and uh, I'm not going to be any worse off than any of my competitors. So really no need to, need to do that. All right. And the next question I have here is, could you please elaborate on the current countermeasures against jamming and spoofing? Whoever wants to jump in on that, feel free. Uh, I think we, we, we have presented a model, which is our zero trust uh, multi-source framework or technology. And so uh, by utilizing uh, additional sources, we can cross check any jamming and spoofing uh, events uh, I, as I, I ha, as I have highlighted the the most difficult event to detect is a spoofing and more specifically the synchronous spoofing attack which is very sophisticated uh, the way it is uh, it is done by multiple trans transceivers or single transceiver and and so with our technology we can identify a, a, a phase shift of about 45 nanosecond. And, and we believe this is state of the art from a spoofing perspective that is synchronous. Uh, and uh, the way we do it, I've highlighted that is that we, we use two receivers uh, to identify that as well as multiple sources that we cross check. All right, perfect. Yeah, I would, um, I would so add that there's lots of things, I'm sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, there's lots of things you can do to uh, mitigate uh, jamming and spoofing, make yourself more resistant. But uh, as, ne as Nino indicated, the uh, 
the best way is to uh, make sure you have an independent source and maybe a couple independent sources to cross check and ensure that uh, if one of your sources, whether it's GPS or something else is bad, you have a, you have other sources to, to cross check that. And if nothing else, at least let you know there's a problem um, and hopefully give you a solution independent of the bad source. All right, so we are going to wrap up. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for sharing the insights with us today. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending. We appreciate your time. And we're going to go over a few closing remarks. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Achieving Resilient and Assured PNT and Secure Smart Grids, brought to you by GPS World Magazine and our sponsor of the event, Asilla Quartz. If we were not able to answer your questions during the presentation or Q&A session, your questions will be forwarded to the panelists to be addressed via email. If you have any additional questions for myself or our speakers, you can reach out to us directly via the email addresses you see on the slide. The resources panel houses a PDF of today's presentation slides, which you can download. To access this panel, click the green icon at the far right end of the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. A recording of this webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow and posted to gpsworldmagazine.com slash webinars. Upcoming webinars from GPS World Magazine also will be posted to that page. Thank you all for attending, and we hope you'll join us for another great webinar.